And good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. This is Harrison Smith with another episode of Cinema. And a quick plug for Deadly Grounds Coffee. Everyone thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. We have very active lifestyles. It's not all wandering the countryside aimlessly or scaring passing motorists. And we all love a good cup of joe. And there's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds Coffee is my guilty pleasure. Bold, robust, delicious. It's coffee that can wake the dead. <laughs> With over a dozen different roasts and flavors, Deadly Grounds can satisfy the most finicky of coffee addicts. The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds Coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. So disgusting. Welcome back, and thanks for joining me. Uh, there were a number of topics that have caught my attention over the last couple weeks, but one that has really stood out for a couple months as of now. And I finally got to see the actual trailer for this uh, at the front of Ghostbusters Afterlife, and I thought, I think this needs uh, an episode, and here's why. Uh, we're talking about Spider-Man No Way Home, and I want to make a disclaimer that uh, I am not a superhero person. I was raised up basically with monsters and Godzilla, never really got into Marvel or DC comics, never really read them, and most of all, have not really followed uh, Disney's Marvel Studios series much at all. I've seen a handful of the films here and there. They don't really do anything for me. Uh, that's great if they do for you. Uh, not passing any judgment. I'm just pointing out that they're just kind of not my thing. However, the studio process that makes them uh, that That is my thing. And that's what this podcast is all about when you see some real cynicism growing in the industry. I think Spider-Man No Way Home in the absolute production of this motion picture shows an incredible amount of cinema, C-Y-N-E-M-A. So let's talk about that first. First, I have a number of links in my show notes. Uh, one of them is a Google search page alone just on the history and the amount of leaks on this simple trailer to this motion picture. So look at that one. But there is a, a great article from thedirect.com and I'm gonna be looking at some of that and the title of it is Why Spider-Man No Way Home Keeps Leaking. Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield Leaks Explained. And I'm gonna go back to that because it gives a pretty good timeline of how these leaks, and I put these leaks, just so you know, for the record, for the rest of this episode, leaks uh, or leak, they're contained in quotes. Those words are contained in quotes because I don't think anything is leaked accidentally. But let's go into that first and, and let's clear up the term leak. At its most innocuous, a leak can be unintentional. It could be a slip of the tongue by an actor or a filmmaker in an interview, confiding in someone believed to be trustworthy, etc. I, I guess, look, they happen. Things like this happen. However, I find it amazing that growing up during the 80s, especially, that this never happened with Darth Vader being Luke's father. I mean, granted, the media versus what we have today, the media then versus what we have today did not exist. And it took a lot longer for news to circulate the globe. But that was some pretty big news. So before we get into the Star Wars Darth Vader thing, for those of you who might remember, and chances are some of you do not, but there used to be a show called Dallas on CBS. And it was a nighttime primetime soap opera. And it became a really big hit for a while there. And it culminated, I, I think Dallas's uh, ratings really culminated or peaked. Peak Dallas was at the time of a character played by Larry Hagman, who was at that time most famous for I Dream of Jeannie, playing Major Nelson. Uh, however, Hagman got a new lease on life with being a villain on CBS's Dallas, playing J.R. Ewing, uh, a very unscrupulous, weasel, snake-in-the-grass kind of character, oil man kind of guy who's screwing everybody over, including his own family. And uh, J.R. was really despicable, and people hated him, and you love to hate him. Well, then at a season cliffhanger, which really started these kind of cliffhanger endings for series, like series, uh, sorry, season finales, uh, Larry Hagman's JR got shot. 
and nobody knew who did it. You saw a pistol fire. He got shot. Was he dead? Was he alive? We don't know. And I was a kid at this time and I really didn't watch it, but I did get caught up in the whole who shot JR thing. And I got to tell you, man, God bless Hollywood and CBS Studios because they kept that shit quiet. And I know there was no internet at the time and there, was, there wasn't 24 hour where, you know, entertainment channels and leaks and all of that stuff. And it, it didn't make it into People Magazine. And from what I heard, a lot of these places, these venues, these periodicals, like they were offering money to insiders at CBS to leak the information. As far as I know, it never got out and people had to wait until the following fall to find out who shot JR. And here's a spoiler, 40 years later, it was his sister, Kristen. She's the one who shot him. But it captivated the world. And even countries that didn't watch Dallas, they wanted to know who the hell shot JR. And it was an incredibly well-kept secret. Now, CBS could have leaked it. They could have leaked hints. They could have leaked, you know, little tidbits here and there to get people going. They could have even leaked fake information, but they did not. And all of that would be to build up hype. But here's the thing. You didn't need to build any damn hype. People were already hyped. So there was no need to leak. And whatever it was, people inside did not leak it either. And that's a credit to the production people, the post-production people who edited. I mean, somebody, a bunch of people knew. Obviously, the people who wrote it, the director, the actors, the post-production people, they all knew. But nobody leaked anything. That can't be said for today. Everything gets leaked, whether it was Game of Thrones and hints of how it's going to end or this, that, and the other thing, this movie. Uh, if you even remember uh, Pet Cemetery's trailer for the remake, um, not so much that there were any leaks, but now trailers just tell you everything. There's, there's just nothing more to be left as a surprise. So this kind of leads me to the next area, and that is the intentional leak and the direct subversion of safety protocols to keep something secret. It's said that Lucas went to great lengths to keep the whole Vader secret locked down from false scripts, false titles. Like when they were shooting Return of the Jedi, it's, it's now pretty much well known by a number of fans and people that uh, with Return of the Jedi, they shot it under the, the false name of Blue Harvest. And uh, there were color-coded scripts and there were some scripts that had fake endings and then there were closed sets. The, the whole thing of whether confirming whether Vader is really Luke's father, that kind of stuff. There were some rumors saying that Lucas went as far as to shoot multiple endings as decoys from the real one. Look, they even did that on Seinfeld. From what I understand, they shot decoy endings so nobody would know the series finale, how it would all end. So, but stuff still leaked out. I still remember that. I remember the internet was starting to really take off at the time and there were rumors. Some of them were fake that Jerry and Elaine were going to get married, that kind of stuff. But in the end, there can be intentional leaks. But as we know, there's always that one person, no matter where we work, where we go, where we are, there's always that one person who has to screw it up for the rest of us. And I'm sure some of you right now are thinking of that person going, I work with that jackass. Many full film leaks onto pirating sites come from those running film festivals or right from the post-production house that is charged with guarding the film. When Godzilla vs. Kong was sitting around for a year and undergoing cuts, it is amazing how footage did not leak from someone who just wanted to let it out. And you may remember Warner Brothers going to great lengths to shut down footage taken by audience members at some Brazilian movie con, I think it was, where literally about three seconds of Godzilla vs. Kong was in a montage of opening scenes to the con's welcome intro. And they locked that shit down. Because there are people out there, and I'll be going into this later in this episode, they just want to leak it because, as Michael Caine once said, just to watch the world burn. So let's first take a, a little bit of a flashback going away from Godzilla vs. Kong for a moment. Back to Star Trek Nemesis, if you remember that one. That was the final feature film of the Next Generation cast. And Picard was going up against his clone, played by Tom Hardy. And that film leaked online. And this was back when the internet still wasn't 
as huge. A lot of people didn't have cable modems at the time. All, all that kind of stuff where getting a full film leaked out, well, that took some effort. And Star Trek Nemesis had its entire film leaked online, but what was worse is before it was done before most of the visual effects had been laid in. And those who had access to the film online saw a very underwhelming cut of green screen and tag scenes where effects should have been laid in. And studio executives at Paramount, they, they blamed some of the film's failure on this leak. There were many reasons for that film's failure, but this certainly did not help. And the need, I think here's where it kind of comes a little bit and it gels. The need to be the one or the first to get information to the masses, often without monetary compensation. I mean, almost all leaks are free. No one's really making money off of leaking information. All of that seems to supersede everything, and that is to control. That person needs to be that person. They might even need to be the spoiler. There is that one person who just wants to ruin things for people. Look, I. it's the attitude of, I have something you don't. I have access to knowledge that you don't. I could give it to you, but maybe I won't because you see it's about control. The internet has now created a global platform where leaking this kind of information gives off a delusion of power. I know the big leak. I have power over you. Leaks are about some kind of personal control. I knew for a year there was a far different cut of Godzilla vs. Kong from an industry friend who saw the test screening. When I sat down in theaters last March, I saw a very different film than what my friend saw. And he was right. From everything he told me, the original cut he saw was superior to the mess that I saw in theaters. And I've done an episode, two episodes on Godzilla vs. Kong and the cynicism behind its making. I had details to support what he had said, that there were two very different cuts, but not once on Twitter for over a year did I ever breathe a word of anything that I knew. And if I did, eh, what would it have gotten me? It certainly would not have gotten me verified with a little blue check mark, that's for sure. And my bank account would not have benefited from me leaking information. All I would have got was, nah, 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 I know something you don't. Then I can tease and I can mock. And all for what? To be a troll? For control? Look at that, troll is in that word, control. Attention? And that, folks, is what I think drives leaks. It's about control, it's about power. Let's go back and look at Star Trek Into Darkness. Because here's something as well where leaks can come out and things change the entire course of the making of a motion picture. And I provided a link uh, to Screen Rant on this about this very thing. And that is, look, J.J. Abrams did something pretty damn cool with the 2009 Star Trek. And what he did was he was able to do what I call the ultimate cinematic hat trick. He was able to go back, create a sequel that was kind of a quasi reboot. It wasn't a remake, but it was kind of a reboot. And he was able to bring Leonard Nimoy's Spock into it all. And he was able to bridge the old original series Star Trek movies with the new and create something totally new. And I, even though I, I don't think the villain was all that good in Star Trek 2009, I, there was a lot to really like about it, I thought, mostly as a writer going, bravo, folks. You really did it. Like you did something really cool here. Now you could go back and not only just retell some stories, but put all new angles on those stories. And they had to follow this up. And so there were rumors that Benicio Del Toro was going to be Khan. Now, again, technically you are making Star Trek 2, right? For this whole new timeline kind of thing. But why would you do that? Benicio Del Toro's Kanye, yeah, I get it. That's pretty cool. But do we need a Star Trek II that is basically going to be a remake of The Wrath of Khan? Give us something new. Go in a totally new direction on things. You have a whole new cast. Leonard Nimoy is on board. Go do something new. But they didn't. And then something happened. I don't know if it was money. I don't know if it was just a falling out over the script. Whatever it was, creative differences. 
But Del Toro left the project. And when that happened, there was a leak. There was information leaked that Del Toro was leaving the project and that he was going to be con. And that threw Abrams and company into a panic. So what did they do? They ran around and they, they got Benedict Cumberbatch, of all people, into this. And they were actually trying to anti-leak the leak. They were putting out false information saying that it wasn't going to be a Wrath of Khan remake. It wasn't going to be anything like that. And Cumberbatch was playing an all different character. They were leaking disinformation because really what they were doing was remaking the Wrath of Khan. And so they hired a Caucasian guy to play Khan. And then here's where comes the trick. This whole parallel universe, alternate universe, multiverse kind of thing, this is going to play into Spider-Man. Because now you have an excuse. You have multiple worlds running parallel or congruently to other worlds. So certain stories can happen in all these multiverses, which could be very similar, but the people look differently because they're different universes. But there's one catch here. And that is the parallel universe or the multiverse doesn't change ethnicity. And that's why I always call Into Darkness a cynical motion picture because they retrofitted their cast to avoid ruining a surprise for the audience. And it backfired big time. So if you're going to say as a Star Trek fan, well, wait a minute, they were in an alternative universe, an alternate universe or a multiverse. And yeah, Khan could be white. No, he can't. If that's the case, then make Kirk black. Make Kirk Hispanic. In fact, let's make Kirk a woman. Let's do that with all the cast. Let's change it all. All the people in the Kelvin timeline, let's change their ethnicities. Hey, Chekhov doesn't have to be Russian and Scotty doesn't have to be Scottish. I mean, if you're going to bitch, then you better be consistent. No, they change Khan's ethnicity with Benedict Cumberbatch simply to throw off the press and try to save a surprise. And let me tell you how well that surprise worked. Because I was in a theater watching Into Darkness and when they announced that Benedict Cumberbatch was indeed Khan instead of the John Harrison thing, which by the way, in the trailer, they mentioned John Harrison. And I remember the character of John Harrison being mentioned in uh, Space Seed, the original Star Trek TV series. I was like, wait a minute, John Harrison, he's going to be, no, Khan's figuring in here somewhere. And sure enough, when they announced that Cumberbatch was indeed Khan, this guy behind me didn't even know him. He stood up and he went, get the fuck out of here. And he said, this is bullshit. And he walked out of the theater. So much for a great fun surprise. And basically what we got with Into Darkness was a really lousy Wrath of Khan remake, which was totally embarrassing. When Spock is yelling, Khan, it was horrible. So you had the anti-leak in that one. Why Spider-Man? Let's go into the intentional or the accidental. None of the leaks in this trailer, keep in mind, the movie hasn't even been released and none of the leaks in this trailer were accidental. I believe they were all calculated by the studio. And that's why it irks me when I look online, I see, oh, you know, Spider-Man trailer leak. No, these are releases. These are official studio releases. So this article from the direct.com, let me just give you the headlines of it so you can understand what I'm talking about. The article says this, and I'm just only going to read you a little bit of it. You can read it on your own. But the article is by a guy named Tom Drew, and it says this. There's one word that Spider-Man No Way Home has become synonymous with over the past years. Over the past year. Leaks. The fan fervor and audience excitement for the upcoming Spider-Man threequel has been bested by very few, reaching Avengers Endgame levels of hype ahead of its release. And it all began with the initial reports revealing the amazing Spider-Man 2's Jamie Foxx's return as Electro, which quickly spiraled into a flurry of other casting announcements and rumors. Bundled within that were the persistent rumblings that Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire would be reprising their respective Spider-Men despite denials from multiple parties, including Garfield himself. And there we go, just like J.J. Abrams denying that Cumberbatch was going to play Khan, 
It's the same thing. Denial, denial, denial. But they're denying with almost a smirk on their face. So the reason for some of these Spider-Man leaks are the following. COVID delays and Spider-Man work from home. COVID had a massive impact on the film industry. And with Spider-Man No Way Home being one of the many films to face numerous delays. Look, I understand that. My own film, Where the Scary Things Are, has been delayed. Uh, again, COVID being blamed. So that drives me nuts, but that's not the only reason. It may be part of it. Then another reason is Sony, Marvel, and actors. On top of the effects of COVID, the number of parties involved in Spider-Man No Way Home's production is much higher than a typical Marvel affair. Spider-Man's MCU installments being a joint venture between Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios means that both companies need eyes on what the wall crawler is getting up to. So it comes down to the bottom line. They want to build hype. And the best way to build that hype is to build an Avengers level hype cycle. And that's exactly what they're doing. In Avengers Endgame, who's gonna live, who's gonna die, who will survive. And, and most of all, about Spider-Man itself, the Spider-Verse with these characters, because you can't really get that out of Ant-Man. Ant-Man's popular, but it's no Spider-Man. So these rumors and leaks have focused on casting because that's important. Who's coming back? What about Alfred Molina? Is he going to come back as Dr. Octopus? And then we see that the Green Goblin is back. Is that Willem Dafoe? And yes, it is. All these actors returning, Jamie Foxx as Electro, they're building all of this up. J.K. Simmons is coming back as J. Jonah Jameson. So we're then revealing all all of these other characters and we're doing the whole is it mcguire will it be garfield were they on set we have rumors that they're on set so it comes down to a lot of hype you know really just building this all up for its marketing and here's the bottom line for me nothing really needs to be explained about this so let's look at their reasons and you can read all of that in the article in my show notes the bottom line, I believe, is saturation. We have reached the point in superhero films where we have so many of them that we just don't know how to make them stand out individually anymore. The whole multiverse thing, in my opinion, is really just another gimmick. And it was masterfully done in Star Trek 2009, but now we can do this and it's a way to spill over into previous franchises. I mean, how many times has Spider-Man been recast and rebooted and remade? So now we can bring them all in and we can stitch them all together to breathe new life into the same old thing. We will now team up all three Spider-Men, evoking nostalgia, creating a new entry into the series while remaking everything as well and increasing that buzz. It is the similar hat trick that J.J. Abrams pulled off with Star Trek 2009. You can get your cake and eat it too. But the other thing is, and the cynical part is, is that studios think you're dumb. They think all of us are dumb. I mean, how can that work? Will it be too confusing? Will the multiverse confuse people and make them not want to watch the film? I mean, what is going on? How can Tobey Maguire be back? What about the storyline from the Garfield films? What about the old Green Goblin or, or Doc Octopus? Well, easy. We now have that multiverse gimmick, and that allows all of these stories to take place in parallel dimensions and converge at certain singular points. The characters are the same, but the people look different, and that's really all. And again, Star Trek 2009 proved that. It's a con job, because it is simply masking a gimmick. And Abrams showed this definitively in Star Trek 2009. The Spider-Man leaks were calculated. They were designed to slowly release bits of information to entice, to tease, and above all, to incite. That's what social media does best. It incites. And if you don't believe me, well, then you've been asleep for the past five years at least. The leaks ramped up because with them came questions. We finally got the trailer, which, like I said, I saw at the front of Ghostbusters Afterlife. And I groaned at the trailer. I mean, first, again, full transparency, like I said, I'm, I'm not a superhero guy. And I, I think they're fine. And I have a good friend who I grew up with who was raised on reading Marvel and DC. I remember as a kid, I mean, he drew all the characters beautifully. I don't know why he didn't go on to work for Marvel. He's that good. But he summed it up best for me a while ago. 
maybe about a year or so ago, when he said that comics and these comic book movies are no longer being made for kids. They're being made for grown fans. And he said, that's the problem. A lot of them are just no fun anymore. They're fan service. And look, I can add a number of film franchises to that hypothesis. Halloween Kills and even Ghostbusters Afterlife clearly show pandering to fans. And you can see my, or listen to, I should say see, you can hear my previous episodes on Halloween Kills and Ghostbusters Afterlife and exactly what it means to bend to that fan service. So what are we getting from all these leaks? I mean, for example, someone once asked me about my reaction to Vader revealing that he was Luke's father in The Empire Strikes Back. Someone asked me online about that. And I replied that I went into The Empire Strikes Back having no absolute clue whatsoever they were going to drop that bomb. There was nothing to foreshadow that in Star Wars. I mean, we, they made it very clear in Star Wars that Darth Vader killed Luke's father. To me, it was nothing. And so I think what this person was asking was, did the audience gasp? Was there a reaction? And what you have to understand is, is that this was before Star Wars became Star Wars. And I think by Empire, it was already becoming that. Like Star Wars had become an institution by that point. But it still had not become a thing. It was solidified in Jedi. That's when I truly felt that Star Wars had become truly a thing. I know, I know it made a lot of money in the first film in Star Wars you know, number one box office. I get all of that, the toys, the merchandising. But what I'm saying is they were still just movies, but Empire started to create that truly expanded universe. So when it was revealed that Vader, or at least Vader told Luke that he was his father, I remember taking it all in stride. And I remember a number of the people that I went with and sitting around me, they kind of took it that way. They were like, oh, because Darth Vader could easily be lying. He could be manipulating. That's what the dark side does, right? He, he would say anything to Luke to bring him over. So we didn't leave that theater going, oh my God, Darth Vader is, is Luke's father. And there was nothing in the press up until that point to even give us a hint about that. I, I can remember, I, I totally went in to The Empire Strikes Back with virgin expectations. So there was nothing there to spoil it for me. We had no idea what was going to go on. We didn't know it was going to be a cliffhanger. We didn't know that Han Solo was going to be frozen in carbonite. And, and we were going to be left for two years pondering all these questions. But that's what Star Wars was a tribute to, damn it. It was a tribute to those old serials that George Lucas and Steven Spielberg used to go to see as kids. They left you with cliffhangers. So I got into all of that and I rediscovered that kind of thing. That's what Raiders of the Lost Ark was all about. It was a serial cliffhanger. So again, there were no leaks for Darth Vader in The Empire Strikes Back. And it was great because then the films became memories and experiences. When Yoda finally, two years later, confirmed Luke's bloodline, then the audience gasped and they did it in Return of the Jedi basically two years later. But we waited and it made the film a memory. I remember coming home on the bus and, and we were discussing, you really think Vader is Luke? No, nah, he lied about it. No, Obi-Wan wouldn't have lied to Luke. And, and we finally got our answers. And no one knew that Luke and Leia were going to be brother and sister. That didn't come out until Jedi. I think that was more of a surprise because Luke had, you know, tongued his sister in, in Empire. You know, so it's kind of like, okay, that's more of a shock than Vader being his old man. But that's what made these movies memories and they held those secrets tightly and we weren't even looking for the answers because frankly there was nowhere to look for them you had a couple magazines here and there and there was entertainment tonight but they were controlled the entertainment tonight stories were controlled they worked in tandem with the studios they're not going to screw the studios over they're not going to dick george lucas over lucas will just say we'll find them we'll cut off all information from our films for you from now on no entertainment tonight they've always been a team player so you're not really getting any surprises and that's what made it great that's what made them movies now we have content. With a wave of superhero movies aside from killing off a major character, what can we do to lure audiences, to entice them, to get them excited? Well, you know, you trot out nostalgia, you get a story do-over, you get to tighten the franchise world even tighter. 
And how do you do it? Well, you give it out little by little. Crumbs from the studio commissary tables. Devoted fans will eat it up because no matter how much they complain, no matter how much they claim to hate such leaks and bitch about them, they will talk about them online and they spread the advertising without even realizing it and you're saving that studio a marketing fortune. Leaks have become the movie version of the self-checkout counter at the store. You are doing the company's work for them. You just don't get anything for it except control. I mean, think about that. Think when you go to use the self-checkout at a grocery store. You're not getting paid. You're not getting a W-2 at the end of the year for the work that you did. You're doing the grocer's work. You're doing the bagger's work. You're doing the store's work and you're doing it for them for free. Well, when you're bitching about these leaks and you're posting them on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and wherever else you want to put them and you're putting them on your blogs, you're marketing for that studio for free. You're not getting paid to do it, but you're spreading exactly what they wanted you to spread. So it's very much like the self-checkout at the store. The leak becomes seeds to spread and grow through this. And that's what the internet does, and it does it well. The belief you are stupid also comes into play. You might get confused because all of those characters, that's what they think. I think if you've been able to keep track of all the characters in over 20 Marvel movies or how many Star Wars films and all these franchises spinoffs, I think you should be okay and manage to get through one film. So it's not so much about the story, it's the multiverse. And that's all you need to know. There's your story complication right there. It's really about the stars, it's about the actors. That's the real hype. The story is secondary. And we are seeing the finalization of film becoming content with all of this. The focus of The Empire Strikes Back was a damn good story. The best screenplay of all the films. It wasn't over Vader being Luke's father. That was just a simple plot point. It was almost a gimmick, but it really wasn't because they didn't emphasize on it. When Vader was finally revealed to us in Jedi, it wasn't a major star under that mask. It was a relatively unknown actor, Sebastian Shaw, because the casting was not the hook. The story was, look, they could have put a a really big star. They could put Marlon Brando under that mask. They could have made it anybody big but they didn't. The Spider-Man leaks are conditioning a whole new generation to embrace immediate gratification. And that goes hand in hand with the 10, 30, 60 second skips on timelines, on streaming or whatever, to just get to the good parts. I can see watching Spider-Man No Way Home on my TV or my phone Just skipping until I see a character. Oh my God, there's Alfred Molina. Oh my God, there's Jamie Foxx. Oh, there's Andrew Garfield. There's Tobey Maguire. Stop, let it play for a few minutes. Okay, I got that. Now skip to the next. And somehow by the end, I've pretty much pieced together that whole story on my own without needing plot and character development, good dialogue, or even basic script and pacing. Instead, I just get to the good stuff because that's what the leaks have given us, right? No more surprises. And if there are, they are secondary story surprises. The surprises are just what you saw. Was Toby on set? I read an article about that. Andrew Garfield denies that he was on set. He didn't film anything. Jamie Foxx, is he back? Defoe, is he back? Melina, is he back? Hell, I heard J.K. Simmons is back. Well, I'm going to ask, do we get Aunt May? Is Cliff Robertson back from the dead? I mean, let's just do it all and leak it all out there. Why the hell bother to go see the movie? Then just thumb your skip buttons when you watch. I mean, that's how you should watch Spider-Man No Way Home. Just watch it with your skip buttons. This is an extremely cynical ploy by studios to build a hype machine by selling out its own material, or shall I say content. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Cinema, C-Y-N, E-M-A. Maybe Spider-Man No Way Home is really good. I don't know. What does it really matter now? They already gave you all the good parts. It's like you ate all the marshmallows out of the Lucky Charms, and now you're just left with that sugar-coated oat cereal. It's just not the same. Because now we do have cereal that is all marshmallows, right? You can buy cereal that is just all the marshmallows from Lucky Charms. No oat cereal to go along with it. 
So this is Harrison Smith, hopefully giving you something to think about. Let me know what you think of Spider-Man No Way Home. I think I've seen everything in the trailer that all that's needed and everything that I've read online. And again, that's a shame. I look forward to talking to you soon and thank you again for your time.